I'm Joe Mikon. I'm Executive Director of the Lafayette Urban Ministry, and on behalf of our board and staff, we are so pleased that you came out on this cold February night and uh, to um, really experience um, something I think uh, is going to be very, very special. Um, and that is a uh, first time that, that I know of a, a really good presentation of Ray Urey's experience in the 1900. Um, Lindy Everts is a retired Purdue professor. And did she teach history? No, she didn't. She taught stats at <laughs> Purdue. But she has a love of history, and in particular, a uh, love of Ray Urey. And she first learned about Ray Urey back in 1996 when Ray was inducted to the Athletic Hall of Fame at Purdue University. And uh, since then, she has taken her research skills and, and really, without doubt, is the preeminent expert in the world uh, on uh, Ray Urey and his history. She's a member of uh, St. Alexis Parish. has two wonderful, wonderful uh, sons, young men, Westcott and Russell. Uh, she has been an after-school volunteer for a long time here at Lafayette Urban Ministry. She is a close and personal friend of Tom Carson, uh, the grandson of uh, Ray Urey, and uh, um, Cindy's uh, um, past husband, Ray, who uh, passed away uh, several years ago, um, was president of the Lafayette Urban Ministry Board when this building was built and dedicated back in 1995. So, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Cindy Evers. I'm blessed to be able to tell you this story tonight. It's one that's been very inspirational to me over the years. And the title of the talk, as you can see, is Strong Hand Forever. That's a loose translation of the Gaelic that you see down uh, below the winged fist of the um, emblem. This is the logo of the Irish American Athletic Club. It was founded in 1897 in New York City. And in 1901, they built the Celtic Park, which was a state-of-the-art stadium. And many, many, many athletic events were held at that stadium in New York. Ray Urey lived about a mile away from that. And so that gave him ample access to good you know, facilities. And a good number of the American athletes during this time period, which would run from, say, 1896 to about the 1920s were members of this particular um, athletic association. And here you have, um, I donated three photographs from the National Gallery in London that were taken by Sir John Benjamin Stone of the Irish American athletes from the 1908 Olympics. This is one of them. And you can see on the left here, I'm not used to using lasers. Ah, there we go. This is, Do this is Dr. John Baxter Jr. He was a veterinarian from University of Pennsylvania graduate. And he's a, a, he's a, well, he's a runner. And this is Lafayette's native son, Ray Yuri, And he's a jumper. And then next to him is Mel Shepard, who also is a runner. So John and Mel were two of the members of the, of the uh, gold Olympic winning relay team. And here you have an assembly of the uh, members of the Irish American Athletic Club. This doesn't happen to be, I'm not quite sure what the circumstances of this photograph were, because this isn't all of the members of the club. Um, but I, they did go to Ireland, and so this may be the group that, after the Olympics, made a uh, tour to Ireland, traveled around, but I'm, but I'm not sure. Anyway, so what you have of interest to us tonight, that is Lewis... Tawanama. He's a marathon runner. He's a Hopi Indian from the Second Mesa in Arizona. Here we have Ray, and then we have Dr. Taylor again, and we have Mel, and that's the tour manager, and then the other uh, young men all have stories in their own right, but we only have an hour, so we won't be telling theirs. And here you have a most interesting photograph. You have five older gentleman in the front row, and then the same folks that we saw in the previous photo. 
And essentially what is going on here is these are the Irish members of parliament. This predates the um, Easter rebellion and these are the Irish members of parliament. And the 1908 Olympics was an interesting uh, political event from the standpoint of how the Irish Americans felt about what was going on in Britain and how the Irish felt. Because the Irish athletes wanted to participate as their own country team. 1908 is the first year that athletes are all participating as a country team. Prior to that, in 1896, 1900, 1904, the Interim Olympics of 1906, people would go as their clubs. And so when you see a, a photograph from the 1900 Paris Olympics that Ray Uri participated in, everybody in the American team has got a different logo on their jerseys depending on who they were jumping for. So you'll see a big P on some of the men's uh, jerseys because they're from University of Pennsylvania. And then you'll see the winged foot of the New York Athletic Club, which was the club that Ray belonged to his entire life. And then you'll see the winged fist logo that you just saw and a number of other ones. So this is the first year, 1908, that the countries are participating as an organized team with a coach, with uniforms, etc. And so the Irish wanted to have their own team, and the Brits wouldn't, wouldn't allow that. They had to participate <coughs> under the flag of the Union Jack. So the Irish Americans, a good number of these young men were actually recent immigrants. They'd been born in Ireland, and they were now citizens of the United States living in New York sort of took up the cause for their home country and were very interested in beating the British. <laughs> the photographer of those three pictures that we just looked at was a member of Parliament himself. He was a very well-known uh, photographer. He actually did the coronation photography for King George V in 1911. He's estimated to have taken over 26,000 photographs. Now, in today's society, that's probably how many Kim Kardashian takes in a month of herself. But back in 1908, what you're talking about are, get, are glass negatives, and they are essentially the size of a piece of paper. I don't know if you've ever been down to the TCHA, and they have boxes and boxes of these big glass negatives. And so to take these photographs was quite an enterprise. He was very well known uh, because of his international traveling. He had come to the United States, taken pictures of Native Americans, been to South America and taken pictures. And he was asked at one point during his life why he was so interested in documenting everything. And he had this lovely quote. He felt it was very important to portray for the benefit of future generations the manners and customs, the festivals and pageants, and the historic places of our times. And probably one of the more interesting anecdotes of his life was when he went down to Brazil in 1892. He was commissioned by the Royal Astro Astronomical Society to photograph the solar eclipse, and he happened to be in the right place at the right time from his perspective, because the rebels were organizing an attack on the, on the governor's palace, and he asked them if he could take their photograph. And they said, sure. And so, before they attacked the governor's palace, they all lined up nice and neatly with their cannon, and they let him take their picture. And then afterwards, with the big mess that they had created, they let him take his picture again. And so Sir, Sir Benjamin Stone ends up being a war correspondent, unlike Brian Williams. <laughs> all right, that was low. <laughs> but it's cold, and we all need to laugh. All right, so the, the 1908 Olympics in London is very interesting to historians of the Olympics because it really is the first modern games. And it's the first modern games on a number of levels. I had mentioned the business about the different kinds of uniforms, which gives you a sense of the organizational differences. But the other thing to note is that this is the first year that the Olympics have a committee that is in charge of, of the goings-on, you know, writes all the rules and, and, and does all of the financing, that is actually separate from the trade fairs. The um, previous Olympics were all done as part and parcel of the World Trade Fairs. This one was no exception. It was, it was on the grounds of the Franco-British 
Expo Trade Fair, but they had a different committee that was overseeing them. They also, for the first time, had a dedicated stadium. And that stadium is sometimes referred to as the White City because this 140-acre plot was all done in concrete. All the buildings were concrete, and so it, that's what, why it was called the White City. But most of the buildings didn't, did not survive, but this stadium that, that they built, and we'll see some pictures in just on the next slide, was intact and used until about 1984, when it was finally torn down. So that was the first. And it had it, all the facilities that they needed. It had the cinder track for, for the track and field runners. It had a swimming pool that was actually twice as big as a standard Olympic swimming pool of today. They had a banked concrete cycling track. Um, it's kind of hard for us to remember just how popular bicycling was at the turn of the century. It was a huge sport. And the green space, of course, was used for gymnastics and soccer and all the other uh, different activities. It had 10 miles of grandstand seating. This was the biggest athletic stadium of its time. They could seat 63,000 people. And then they had standing room for another 30,000. And for one event, it was packed solid, and they had to lock the doors, and that was the marathon. And we'll see some footage of that later and understand why that was so important. And as I mentioned before, the countries are participating as teams for the first time. And while these games had some events prior to July and after <coughs> July, like soccer events and, and, and things like that, most of the uh, concentrated events were from the 13th to the 25th, which meant that they could have a very fancy opening ceremony. And they did. And this is the beginnings of the tradition that we all know and love so well as the, the grand opening ceremony for the Olympics. The judges were all British. This was very problematic, as we will uh, see later on. Uh, you can only imagine why. And after that, that was changed. Um, it was not the case in 1912 that all of the uh, judges were Swedish. There were approximately over 2,000 participants. Only around 44 were women. Women were allowed to do all manner of tennis, so singles, doubles, you know, the usual stuff. Uh, they did a lot of archery. Archery was a very favorite sport in its day. And for the most part, that was, that was it. The other thing to note is that this lovely statistic at the bottom, that the Irish American Athletic Club won 10 of the U.S. 22 medals. So, so one club from New York that was uh, diversely uh, made up had more than Germany, France, and Italy combined. So here you can see the White City Stadium at uh, Shepherd's Bush. And you can see up at the top here that there are covered areas. Uh, the king and queen were under the uh, covered area. And then here you can see on the outside that those are all of the areas that where the athletes would dress. One of the things that's different about the 1908 Olympics from modern Olympics is that they had no Olympic village. So all of the American athletes, for instance, were housed out in Brighton. They had to get on the train, travel for 45 minutes, be at the events, then get back on the train and go back to their lodgings. And that's how it was. And down here, you get a sense of some of the lovely architecture of uh, the different trade uh, expositions, buildings. And you can see where the stadium fits in there, and you can see the bicycling track, and then the cinder track is here, and there's the great big huge swimming pool. So these photographs are predating, of course, you know, the um, commercial use of airplanes, and so they're either taken from a balloon, as this one is taken from a hot air balloon, or they're taken from the top of this. That is a, uh, you know, entertainment ride called the uh, to and fro, and it went like that. <laughs> This is also the first time that they sat down and were very systematic about how they would do all of the prizes and the badges and the cups and the trophies that, that they gave out. And they hired a guy from Australia who was well known for his art, uh, Bertram McCannell, to do it. And there were two basic kinds of medals, commemoration medals, which are not here, 
and the medals that we associate with the Olympics, the gold, bronze, and the silver. I couldn't find a really good picture of the backside of the medal, so this in real life would have been the same color as this one. And what you have on the front, of course, is the athlete being coronated after he's won. And then on the back side, you have the patron saint of Britain, which is uh, St. George. And then they had another series of medals, which we would really probably call field badges. So if you were a participant and you were, say, a field judge or a measurer, you would have a badge that looked like this so that you had access into the arena and everybody understood what your official position was. And then if you were an athlete, you would also have a badge similar to that. The um, uh, medals were all presented in these small leather boxes. They had the events printed on the front, and then once the athlete won, they would do the engraving on the edge of the medal. So, so there's nothing on the um, boxes itself. And this was all, as I said, uh, groundwork for how the medals would be done in subsequent um, Olympics. And couple, two years ago, these three, the bronze, the gold, and the silver medals with their uh, matching leather boxes, sold at auction in, in London for 2,600 American dollars. There are also cups and statues for some of the events. And so if you were doing cycling, rowing, polo, bird shooting, that was an Olympic event, uh, football, wrestling, fencing, swimming, you had the chance, in addition to getting one of the, the gold medal, you would also get um, a cup. So it looks like, you know, the sort of standard trophy cups that you've probably seen. And then if you were doing the, if you won the marathon, the discus, the yachting, or the gymnastics, you got a statue, and, and you want to watch for the statue for the marathon. It's pretty impressive. <clears throat> and then one of the things that you'll see in the 1908 uh, news footage of the Olympics is that there's a lot of people carrying around what looks like maps and tubes. And what they're carrying are these diplomas. And so if you had one, you got this one, and they put your name right here, and, and then what your event was. And then if you just participated, but you didn't win anything, then you got this Diploma of Merit. And the tubes were all different colors to sort of make sure that the judges didn't get confused and give the wrong diploma to the wrong person. And the gold medal diplomas happened to be 20 inches long, and they're in red tubes. Well, the footage is black and white, so we'll have to imagine. And so this was all laid out. There's a, there's a formal 1908 report of the Olympics, and all of this stuff is outlined in that. So the trouble starts at the opening ceremonies. The, the athletes come in with their flag, and they go around the track once, and then they line up in front of the uh, king's area, and they're, so it's in the center of that, of that track. And then once they're all, they've all paraded once around and they're all lined up, then they're each presented to the king. So there's this classic legend. Whenever you read about the 1908 Olympics, you'll run into this legend that the leader who's carrying the flag, and that's Ralph Rose of San Francisco, He's a very tall man, he's about six feet four, he's a shot putter. So he's burying the flag. There's this legend in Olympic lore that when the athletes came into the uh, stadium, they were outraged because the stars and stripes were not included in the entry flags. So everybody's up there, all the flags are there. There's even one for China and one for Japan, and the Chinese and the Japanese didn't actually participate. But there's no stars and stripes. That part is true. That's verifiable. And one, one would guess, given the um, kind of politics involved in this particular Olympics, that yes, the athletes, the American athletes, of course, were somewhat perturbed by that. And supposedly, the team captain shown here, this is, this is uh, Martin Sheridan, he's a shot putter and a discus uh, thrower, said to Ralph Rose, this flag dips before no earthly king, meaning that 
because the athletes had been uh, slighted without having their stars and stripes up above on the, the stadium there, that they were not going to dip the flag to the king, which is very disrespectful at that time. And so um, the Irish uh, American commissioner, he'd actually been born in Ireland, James E. Sullivan, filed a formal complaint to the Olympic Committee about the fact that there was no stars and stripes. This was one of many complaints. James E. Sullivan was pretty much filing complaints almost every day. There were a lot of things to, um, that he was quite annoyed with. And, and, and a lot of them, justly so, as we will see. And the British Olympic Council formally apologized. They claimed they couldn't find one. But I suspect that it was just one of those things that happens when you have an event that you've never done before and it just, yeah, whatever. Well, James E. Sullivan made so many complaints that by the time it got to the end of uh, the Olympics, King Edward VII was so fed up that he wouldn't give out the prizes. <laughs> and so his wife had to do it, uh, Queen Ale Alexandra. So in this footage, when you see them giving out the prizes, you will see her, not him. Now, so there's no mention of the flag dipping in the contemporary press of 1908. And two authors who are very much interested in Olympic history, Bill Mallon and, and Ian Buchanan from in 1999, did an extensive study to try to get down to the bottom of what this legend is. Because you know, it's a great Hollywood story. We're ticked off and we're not going to dip the flag to you. It's a great line. And they tracked it down and they said the first report of Sheridan's quote is 1952. Think about what was going on in 1952. Cold War, we're adding under God we trust to the Pledge of Allegiance. And so this, this idea that you're not going to dip the flag kind of plays into the zeitgeist of the 50s. And it first shows up in, in, in Whalen's book. And note that all the other controversies that occurred at the Olympics show up in the papers. They show up in the U.S. papers, they show up in the London papers. Every little thing that goes wrong is all over the press. But not this extremely disrespectful thing about not dipping the flag to the king. That is nowhere to be found in the American press or the British press or anybody else's press. So it's quite certain that it didn't happen. So what did happen? Well, when they come into the stadium here, they're just parading around the track. <laughs> Nobody is dipping the flag at that point. So in that sense that, yeah, they didn't dip the flag when they made their first parade around the track. But when they're all lined up and they are presented to the king, then yes, everybody dipped the flag. That was the tradition. And in 1942, it's no longer the tradition because in 1942, there was a law passed in Congress, didn't have anything to do with this, it had to do with military service during World War II, that um, no flag would be dipped to mortals or inanimate objects. So since 1942, there's no flag dipping. You know, you could be in London and they wouldn't be doing it. So that's one legend. The only other thing I would want you to note real quickly here is this picture is from 1904, and you can see the difference in the team uniforms. There's the Irish American logo, and there's the New York City Athletic Club of the winged foot right there. Okay. All right, controversy number two. One of the events that was very popular was the tug of war. And the Americans had to compete against the Liverpool police, shown here. And the Liverpool police came in the outfits they normally wore when they did their tug of war. Great big heavy boots with kind of like soccer cleats on the bottom. And the Americans show up down here and they've got track and field clothes on and they've just got like track and field shoes. And here's the Brits over here from Liverpool with their great big heavy boots. The first week of the Olympics, it was terrible weather. It rained and rained and rained. The field was really, really soggy. We'll see a clip uh, in the uh, film, and I want you to watch for what happens when the guy puts his pole down for the pole vault and all the water comes up <laughs> from the impact. And so, of course, what happened was the very first tug, the Americans just were pulled right over the line. No contest. 
and the British press <laughs> gleefully noted the United States remained as competitors for the shortest time on record. The Liverpool police pulled them over the line almost as soon as they threw their weight on the rope. So the English were all just, you know, chortling away, and James E. Sullivan filed another complaint. <laughs> and the Olympic Committee was like, well, okay. And there was a big argument about whether or not the rules stated, you know, the foot gear and all that kind of stuff. And so finally they decided that, yeah, they'd do a rematch, and the Americans could, you know, compete against the Liverpool, and everybody would just wear socks. And the Americans declined. So the Brits, it actually the London team took the gold in the, the tug of war. And then on July 23rd, we come to the 400 meter race. And there was some talk beforehand after, you know, the, the different um, preliminaries when it became evident that for the gold medal, you were going to have three Americans running against one Brit. And it seemed like a good opportunity for trouble. And trouble happened. And here we have Dr. Taylor and W.C. Robbins, the British uh, Lieutenant Halswell, and J.C. Carpenter, the American. And this is a good point. To, this is a good place to point out the uh, basic worldview differences or perspectives between the British athletes and the American athletes. The American athletes took their training really seriously. They belonged to athletic clubs. They had professional trainers. They did, you know, weightlifting kinds of programs. They were very, very competitive.